Brian Lehrer on WNYC, live in the green space today, our ground floor theater here at WNYC at 160 Varick Street. And when we're in the green space, you can watch the show as well as listen. You can see live streaming video at WNYC.org or on the WNYC Facebook page. This month, New York City and the world are commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising in June of 1969, when LGBTQ bar patrons clashed with the NYPD, a pivotal moment in the movement for LGBTQ rights and acceptance of everyone's full humanity. Progress has been very significant since then, but things are still complicated. On the one hand, NYPD Commissioner James O'Neill apologized for the actions of the police department for harassing patrons of the Stonewall Bar. The apology came last Thursday. I think it would be irresponsible of me as we go through World Pride Month not to speak of the events at the Stonewall Inn in June of 1969. Well, I'm certainly not going to stand up here and pretend to be an expert on what happened at Stonewall. I do know what happened should not have happened. The actions taken by the NYPD were wrong, plain and simple. The actions and the laws were discriminatory and oppressive, and for that, I apologize. NYPD Commissioner O'Neill last week. On the other hand, the Vatican on Monday, and maybe many of you have not heard this, flatly rejected what it cast as the notion that individuals can choose their gender. The document stated that the idea of gender moving along a spectrum is, quote, nothing more than a confused concept of freedom in the realm of feelings and wants, unquote. And that's from Pope Francis, often hailed as a progressive. So with us now are Kai Wright, editor and host at WNYC's Narrative Unit, host of the great podcasts The Stakes, The United States of Anxiety, and There Goes the Neighborhood, and a columnist for The Nation, and Jay Vanasco, WNYC editor, coordinating all of the World Pride Month coverage, including a three-night special next week that will be hosted by Kai with Stonewall-related call-ins next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights at 8. So hi, Kai. Hi, Jay. Hey, hey, Brian. Brian. Um, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the actual day <laughs> when Stonewall occurred. Um, but, Jay, what is known that patrons of the bar were constantly harassed by the NYPD? That's what's known. What, why do you think the night of Stonewall in June of 1969 was different? Because it was certainly not the first time they were harassed by the police. That's true. And it, of course, wasn't just this bar. There were a lot of gay bars in New York. But... Uh, Stonewall was special, actually. It um, first, the thing that makes it like kind of not so special is it was filthy. It was <laughs> so dirty. Like the bathrooms were dirty. There was no toilet paper. People were selling toilet paper outside the stalls. There was like um, they had no running water behind the bar, so they had this like wash tub, and they would just when people, somebody was done with a drink, they would just dip the glass in and hand it to the next person. Uh, and that maybe caused a small hepatitis outbreak in the village. Yeah, so dirty. And so you'd be like, why would anybody go there? But the reason why people went there is that Stonewall was one of the few bars in the, in the city, really, that let, let everyone in. So not just white gay men, but also more butch lesbians, transgender people, people of color. Um, everyone was able to come to the Stonewall. And Probably because it was a dive bar they let everyone in, right? Let's be honest. But but like that meant that there's also a lot of like homeless queer kids. And so these a lot of these people, these weren't like white middle class professionals who were worried about like them getting outed and them losing their job in a bank and them losing their family. These are people who often were living on the streets who were fighting the police all the time because the police were constantly harassing them. And so that night, usually actually police raids were done like earlier. In the week, they were done at like six o'clock on like a Tuesday to just like get their numbers done. But like, they didn't. That's not when this happened. This happened like one in the morning for some reason. Um, people were drunk, right? And so like the combination of those things made just made it ready for a fight. And that's what happens. You want to add anything to that, Kai, from your understanding of history? I think it's a great history of it. I, I mean, I think there's also sort of the the broader moment that was happening. Um, and 
uh, you know, this is the late 60s, and this is a time in which, um, uh, particularly amongst the, it should say, movements of LGBT people at the time, uh, there was uh, an active movement amongst women, there was an active movement amongst um, various factions uh, inside the, the, the community, but everybody was growing tired of what had been a conversation about how do we negotiate our normality with folks, what do we need, to, you know, how do we negotiate the space? And I think it was a moment where we, as a community, said no, actually we reject the idea of deviance. And I, I think that is, that, that is the important tone. Talk, point talk about that, what a concept. We reject the idea of deviance as a thing. As a thing, we will not be deviance here in this bar because that's part of the, the you know the, the the real emotional reason people. I mean, I wasn't there. But the real emotional reason people are going to a space like Stonewall is it's a place where you don't have to be considered a deviant. Um, and um, and and up until that time, there was a lot of work. You know, with even because this wasn't the first time that the, the movement began. I mean, people were marching. There were marches in Washington. There were there protests, were other bar raids. There were other bar raids. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very much you would put on a suit and tie and march. You know, mm -hmm. um, it was very much to say we are look at us. We're no, you know we're normal like you. And the change here is is a really important one in the the psychology uh, of the community that said actually I'm not deviant. I am not deviant. I will not be deviant. And then that echoes through the next 50 years of, of, of community making. It's just a fundamentally different conversation that we were insisting on having. And this is a very important thing that Kai said because uh, what I, 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 I talked to a lot of people who are at Stonewall, and one of the things they would say is what changed them as individuals was kind of fighting shoulder to shoulder with other people. The police expected them to do what they always did, which is leave quietly. Um, and that's not what happened. And by fighting together, there, there's one man, Martin Boyce, who said, um, like, that made me feel like a man. Like, before, he had, like, accepted society's view of him. And after that, he just didn't. Listeners, um, <clears throat> you can help us kind of launch here our coverage of uh, the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. There's going to be a lot on the station in the next couple of weeks. Um, Kai's three-part series next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. We're going to be doing a six-part series that's a history series called Prejudice and Pride, Decade by Decade Since Stonewall, which will start a week from next Friday and then go over six shows. But I wonder if anybody's listening right now. I'm kind of going fishing for anybody who might have been at the Stonewall Uprising, 212-433-WNYC, 212 433 Nine six nine two, or short of that, what about anybody else who's you know from any corner of the LGBTQ community? Maybe like the first time you heard about Stonewall, if you remember that, if you're younger, uh, or just weren't there, and whether the symbolism of Stonewall has been important to you in any way, since obviously there's a whole world of conversations and topics and rights issues and humanity issues, uh, but Stonewall is the hook right now for historical reasons. So when did you first hear about Stonewall, and what, if anything, has it meant to you? 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. Kai, what, what do you think it meant um, that uh, the, the clip we played that the NYPD commissioner apologize for Stonewall last week? I'm not sure what I make of it. I mean, God bless him, you know, and, um, and I think it's important um, for so many social justice issues in, uh, in our country where we just move on and we don't actually try to have a conversation about reconciliation and taking accountability for what occurred. And so, I, I, you know, I, it's sort of uh, reminiscent of some previous apologies that we've heard that during the Obama administration, during the Clinton administration, for things uh, that the state did to communities in the past. And so that's good and that's great. Um, I think there is, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, a, a big question we have now is, you know, what is then as a community our relationship to the state uh, and to officialdom 50 years on? Um, uh, I, 
NYPD marches in the Pride Parade. <laughs> um, uh, and some people feel great about that. And some people feel really upset about that uh, every, every year. Uh, you mean that, gay cops march in the Pride Parade? Gay cops march in the Pride Parade, but there's it, but also uh, it's, you know, it's a celebration of police force, you know. Um, and um, or to some it feels like a celebration of, of policing, which is... Uh, and uh, not always been a great thing for queer people right up until today. You know, I mean, there is a, at the same time that's happening, there's, a, there's an often volatile relationship still between NYPD and the young people, uh, mostly of color, who are queer and who are hanging out in the West Village, um, who are often quite aggressively policed. Uh, because people in the, in the neighborhood don't want them around, uh, so so there. It's great to hear these these apology this apology for the past, but there do remain questions about the relationship between the community and NYPD today. And in the news right now, in fact, there's the death of a young trans woman at Rikers for Island, instance. and we don't know what happened, and we don't know if there was any mistreatment of her by the authorities that um, contributed to her death, but you can see by the community's response that there's a history of suspicion that has not all been erased uh, right. by the apology or by you know maybe gradual improvement over time. Let's take a phone call. Line two, Michael in Brooklyn. You're on WNYC. Hi, Michael. My call. Hi, Kai. It's Michael from the old neighborhood. Um, <laughs> Hello, I, Michael. Uh, <laughs> Listen, I don't really Wait, need which to is the that old, much. What's the old neighborhood? bed -Stuy. I used to live in bed -Stuy. <laughs> Okay. Go ahead, Michael. bed -Stuy. Um So I don't need to stay on the, on the line that long. I just think, well, first of all, I'll just say that I'm a 58-year-old man, so I was, you know, seven years, whatever. I was uh, eight years old at the time of Stonewall. Um, and I grew up uh, not even necessarily in my early, like, uh, digit, single digits and teen years knowing about Stonewall per se. But I lived in Brooklyn. I grew up in Coney Island. I did know that we were in this burgeoning era of something called gay liberation. And, of course, as a little kid, I knew that ultimately I was probably gay. But it was very confusing because what can you do with that, you know, if you're, t if you're 8, 10, 12 years old and you're seeing all this stuff about gay liberation and you're, you're not really sure what that has to do uh, to you, it's also kind of scary. But all I really wanted to say was... One of you two, if you don't mind, please mention, uh, just for historical reasons, the Judy Garland, even if it's a myth or a legend and it didn't really have anything to do with the uprising, I think that in terms of educating younger people today about that moment, it's worth mentioning. Thank you very much. Jay, it was okay. the, the day of Judy Garland's funeral, right? It sure was, um, and that is not the reason why people rioted so much. <laughs> <laughs> all the things we do not know, we don't know what the inciting incident was, we don't know exactly who was there, the thing that we do know, that is absolutely not it. <laughs> But it's interesting because, you know, I mean, throughout my life uh, as a gay man, you know, I mean, it, it, what is clear is there's always this Stonewall represents, we map so many things onto it, you know, depending on who we are. Um, and the story, just the very story of what happened, because it is so murky, you know, has taken on all these different meanings depending on what it needs to mean to you. Was it about, That's exactly right. you know, was it a, a, a fight over trans rights? You know, was it a fight over housing rights for the homeless kids? Was it a fight, you know, was it really white people there? Was it really black people there? Was it about sexual liberation, or was it about we we what what we want it to be? It becomes a sort of a Rorschach test of of what is important to to you as an individual. And we say just really quickly, the Judy Garland myth started uh, an anti-gay actually columnist um, said basically that he thought like that's of course why the the queens were rioting. Um, three. I will note that of our ten lines. Three of them are referencing Judy Garland. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to line six, Michael in the East Village. Michael, you're on WNYC. Hello. Yes, thank you for taking my call. My memory, I was 12 years old in June of 69, uh, and me and my best bud, we grew up on the Upper West Side. Me and my best buddy lived across the street. We'd go down to the village to play like weekend hippie. And one night we went down, we uh, got off the number one train at Christopher Street, Sheridan Square, and there was this massive movement of people. There wasn't any violence, I don't remember that. Massive movement of people all going in one direction, and we fell in with them. We ended up in front of a townhouse in the West Village, and Bella Abzug came out in a house coat and fuzzy slippers and appealed for calm and said that it was time for everyone to go home. This was while the... The riots were not just one night, and I think that the violence had pretty much petered out at that point. But that's my recollection of uh, Michael, June of 69. Thank you for that story. Bella Abzug, my in, congresswoman. In house slippers. Michael, in thank house you very much. And, and, well, and, and, and house coat and fuzzy slippers. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to line five, Stephen in Manhattan, who, you know, that caller said it wasn't just one night. And Stephen is calling, I think, with, a, with an explicit night two memory. Stephen, you're on WNYC. Thank you so much for calling in. Oh, certainly, Brian. Huge fan of yours. Uh, I'm 78 years old now, so I do have a very clear memory of it all. And I was, the, the night that Stonewall happened, I was in line at Frankie Campbell to pay my respects to Judy Garland with a number of friends. And when I got home, uh, there were messages on my answering machine about what happened at Stonewall. And we all went the second night. We didn't get, like, in front of it or near it because the crowds were huge. But what I found fascinating about it that night, it was the first time that so many diverse gay and lesbian people were all together. There were Wall Street people, theater guys, leather queens, uh, and and uh, women that had signs that said Butch Dykes, and, and, and there were lipstick lesbians. There was every kind of division of gay there. And we were not in the same places at the same time very often. And there was such a strength represented in that. And, um, uh, and, and, and me and my friends, we, we were honoring Judy Garland. And, you know, at, at that point in, in the crowd, the conversation was a lot about that her death did have something to mm. do with this. And I know it's all cloudy, and I know it's 50 years later, but mm -hmm. this is my memory of what happened as I was standing there thank the second evening. Stephen, thank you so much for your call. You're welcome, Brian. All Jay, the best. you've got a big grin on your face. <laughs> I, I mean, of course, there were people, there were lots of people who did, in fact, go to the funeral. Um, and maybe that contributed to the general feeling of like exhaust and like emotional exhaustion that like led to people, but I don't. Yeah, well, <laughs> and you know, and memory. Um, memories are different, and memories are imperfect. Um, our team of fact checkers in the control room on Stephen's call said, he said there was a message on his answering machine. It was 1969. Were there answering machines yet? Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's like the Starbucks cup in Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's similar to, I mean, what, what the spirit of what is Stephen is saying there, I think, is wonderful. I mean, people, there were a lot of people there for a lot of different reasons, I imagine, right. you know? And I think what's notable, you know, as he's talking about that there was this real diversity in that moment, pretty quickly that diversity broke down and has been a challenge for the community ever since, you know, is trying to recapture that spirit of having people who actually, what is a LGBT, is there an LGBT community? Is there an LGBT politic? Um, or is it many different things? Um, and, uh, and that has been a challenge, both a challenge and a strength uh, for this community ever since the night of that, of, of that uprising. And as we run out of time in this segment, Kai, why don't you just say what kinds of things you're planning to focus on in your three-night Stonewall-related call-in next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights on the station at, at 8 o'clock. It is going to be like a hyper-local thing, isn't it? It's going to be hyper-local. I mean, this is a New York story, and we're super excited about that. So we're going to talk about the village at that moment and what was going on in the village and in that very particular place, in that very particular history. Uh, we're going to talk about this turning, the idea of a turning moment, you know, that not just then, but all the turning moments that we've had since then as a community, uh, where people People have said, you know what? No, not today. No more. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about, we want to think about the future and intergenerational conversation. That's something we've started talking about on the podcast on the stakes, you know, is where are we going from here and all of the multiplicity of identities um, and experiences that are just very different for young people now than they were for me when I was coming of age. So that, that's going to be our conversation. Can't wait. Jay, you want to add anything? Last quick word. Maybe maybe next week you'll solve the, the Judy Garland <laughs> question. You know, certainly I could see how grief, even over a public figure who you didn't personally know, can add to the intensity of your emotion about something. Um, so who knows? It, I'd like to just say that uh, historian George Chanty, what he said about that is that the thing that the gay community, the LGBTQ community learned from Stonewall is that change requires struggle and resistance. And... I think that that's 
Right. And I think that, you know, it's because activists a year later said, we're going to remember Stonewall. We're going to march. That's why we remember it. We don't just remember it because it was a bar raid. We remember mm. it because a lot of very smart activists got together to resist. Please thank WNYC's Kai mm -hmm. Wright and Jay Vanasco. Mm -hmm.